So how you're creating, how are you creating a database of intentions? So this is the, this is the third and, and last part, which I think is an important, interesting, because I've been looking for words to describe this, uh, this term and database of intentions. I, I love it. So John Battelle, who launched, helped launched Wired and the industry standard, described search as one of the most important cultural artifacts of our time, the database of intentions, the aggregate result lists of every search results, um, every click, every path taken as a result. It's a massive click stream database of needs, wants, and desires that can be exploited for all sorts of ends. And we'll talk about some of the ends that it can be exploited for later. This fits very closely with what I've been referring to in terms of our artificial unconsciousness, uh, this connection between what results you are shown, and what you end up clicking on provides this detailed understanding of our unconscious desires, and is why we often end up with certain search results or feeds or videos um, that are designed to trigger these desires. Uh, so for example, when Safia looked into, well, why is porn ranking so high among the top search results for black girls? Uh, she found that online porn companies are ranking higher be by building SEO optimized uh, porn pages that match specific fetishes. So it's giving some people exactly what they're looking for. Uh, the term is vague, so other results do not get as many clicks. The only way to fix this is to, say, generate enough media attention in order to force a change by Google. Like, hey, no porn on the first page of search results, please. Or it's to create SEO optimized pages that look similar to the porn result. Uh, but they direct them to something else could be like, Hey, look at this page kind of looks like what you would expect from a porn page, but it's like, you know, this, these kind of results really hurt, uh, people of color, right? Like, and here's some things you should know. I don't, I don't know if that would work, but that would be one way to do it. And it goes to say that if we don't learn search engine optimization, or at least how to draw the attention of companies such as Google, uh, these results will not change. Like the example was the uh, three brown teenagers, like six years later, nothing's changed. Um, companies make money by being on the top of search results. So there has to be like, unless there's a financial incentive, um, these types of social just justice issues will likely always uh, rank lower uh, on any search results. I hope that's making sense. Now, Safia argues that Google should be broken up into multiple independent companies, uh, since it's exactly this merging of data that creates a very detailed picture of who we are. Uh, so, of course, it's ironic that in 2015, around the time of her book being published, uh, Google combined the data from all of its different properties into a single merged database of effectively your desires. Uh, you probably saw this as the one account, all of Google campaign. Uh, and this included data from the online advertising platform, DoubleClick, uh, whose clients included Microsoft, General Motors, Coca-Cola, Motorola, L'Oreal, Apple, Visa, and Nike, meaning that most of your actions on web pages since 1995 have been added to your Google profile. Uh, for many, this was just another terms of service that we had to agree to. But for Google, this provided a history and an evolution of our desires over time. Professor Safia Noble um, argues that governments that choose to make the internet a public utility, say like water, need to also look at making certain internet services, such as search, public utilities as well. Otherwise, they will be introducing a public utility rife with racial and gender bias. So if you're going to offer internet for everyone, or you're going to make it a public good, 
you may want to look at offering search as a public good for all people as well. Because if you don't, and you go with the status quo, you will be introducing this bias directly to your population. Now, speaking of politics, uh, we've established that AI has a very hard time critical thinking. Uh, so content moderation often falls onto outsourced workers who use rubrics. Uh, and as UCLA professor Sarah Roberts, uh, whom I had the pleasure of interviewing in the past, who showed how these rules tend to bias towards allowing liberal perspectives while rejecting many others. Um, and this is interesting because a judiciary, a judiciary committee hearing uh, with a Google executive revealed that 99% of U.S. political donations from Google executives and employees were to Democrats. Uh, I'm sure many of you have also read this week just about the class action lawsuits by Donald Trump um, against big tech for the same types of bias. Uh, this should lead to some interesting discussions about political bias in big tech. And it'll be, of course, very interesting to see if this changes anything. But you can be rest assured that political bias exists in big tech. Now, like we said at the beginning, once we have a database of desires, it's very easy for it to be exploited for all sorts of ends, be they financial, competitive, or political. Uh, this is another reminder why your data and your privacy is so important. You're volunteering your vote and your voice, and you won't have rights to have these uh, search results and rankings changed. When we see search results, maybe not don't see them as the truth, but see them as the question, what's the financial incentive for this to be at the top of the search result ranking? Who is the person or who is the company or who is the interest that wants this to appear at the top? And I think when you start to see search from this perspective of it's what it is because somebody wants it to appear at the top. It'll be much more clear as to why you see certain types of results. And sometimes when you see like really terrible bias, when you search certain cultures, uh, you'll start to see why. You'll start to see why this starts to appear as the top result and why like there's a financial, there's almost always a financial incentive. Um, it could be like a newspaper just trying to to sell like some kind of, uh, some kind of thing, or it could be a uh, like a, a porn company that is trying to make that result appear to the top. If you understand what is the financial uh, incentive, you'll be less surprised at the result, and you'll have much more understanding as to why why these results keep appearing uh, at the top of these. And yes, of course, these result these haven't changed, but the difference is we have more recourse uh, when it comes to a public utility like the categorization of the Library of Congress uh, cataloging system to require changes or to make changes. Um, but when it comes to a private good, such as Google, uh, we don't have those types of rights. So it it's going to be more of a challenge, like you have to use maybe media pressure or public pressure um, to achieve your ends. 